Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Fierro. Welcome to the English 3H Artificial Intelligence Podcast. I'm going to be your MC today. If you don't know what that means, look it up. We're going to be taking a look at a couple of videos about artificial intelligence that you guys, you, you, the viewer, submitted. And I'm going to sit here and I've been tasked with doing the hard work. Of, of editing again again the, the heavy burden and hard work of what editing is so I'm gonna do that to your guys's videos and that's gonna be it also just a quick before we start I want to say that you guys are absolute heathens sending me your videos in different resolutions some in 720p some in 480p two of you who shall not be named two of you had your video's default resolution at 360p. It, who uses that anymore? So our first video is going to be from two people about defining artificial intelligence. I'm afraid to butcher both of their names, so I'm just going to put them in the chat bubble right there. Um, yeah, let's let's watch it. Defining artificial intelligence. When we think of artificial intelligence, many of us tend to think of driverless cars and robot helpers. Artificial intelligence started in the 1920s as being science fiction. It slowly made a step moving from AI being a hype to a reality in the 1950s. AI has the ability to make logical inferences, solve problems, adapt, interact, and learn, which all allows us to understand patterns, further known as ideas and knowledge. Artificial intelligence entered our lives by solving business problems due to technical developments. These can include advances in algorithm, massive data, and an increase in computational power and storage at low cost. Artificial intelligence seems unlikely to take humanity by surprise. When it comes to technology, we humans always want more than what we already have. But because of artificial intelligence, millions of jobs will disappear in the coming years to robots or driverless cars, which can spark social unrest. If you look at us now, the amount of ATMs rising means fewer branches, which further leads to even fewer employees. Currently, truckers drive about 11 hours a day with a 30 minute break somewhere in between. The electronic logbooks that drivers use track their drive time and the breaks that they take. With driverless technology, it allows for more work hours, along with time to organize inventory, communicate with clients, and spend more time with their families. When it comes to technology, the United States is generally considered to be the nation leading the charge towards the use of AI. With tech giants like Google and Microsoft, the US is pouring large amounts of cash into research and development of AI. With the high technology of artificial intelligence, people assume it functions and is just as smart as a human brain. Social anthropologist Sitara Gu Kina reports the findings of philosopher Herbert Dreyfus who separates the two intelligences, saying artificial intelligence excludes three human elements when recognizing patterns. The first element is insight, when a person can recognize a same, the same object in different orientations, sizes, or distortions. The second element is friend consciousness, when a human can recognize an object with lists or traits, but the person is not aware that they are thinking of a list unlike AI. Last, humans have a context dependency or ambiguity reduction. Human activities have a context behind them, such as a sentence having a meaning behind it. The context is developed by past experiences in order to reduce the range of interpretations for a sentence. But AI is context-free and can have multiple interpretations when creating a sentence. Human intelligence and artificial intelligence may come up with the same conclusions, but function differently. The human brain has qualities that can overcome some of the obstacles AI cannot. This can create a line between defining the brain and artificial intelligence, so the two cannot be the same. Pattern recognition of AI can help in the medical field in areas doctors cannot. Philosophy professor Tim Dare discusses AI can predict and diagnose diseases by correlating data across hundreds of thousands of patients in order to improve the treatment of the disease. But this changes the ethical right to confidentiality for patients' medical data and the rights for patients to be fully informed on their treatment and diagnosis. 
but the AI research would be too complex to explain for AI to be utilized in the medical field. Its initial unethical actions need to be changed. AI needs to be taught the ethics and morals of our society. For example, in self-driving cars, the AI need to know the ethical decisions to yield, stop, slow down, or how to even prevent a crash. For example, if a car is speeding and a child crosses the road, the car must decide to drive forward or swerve into the opposing traffic in order to make an ethical move. Artificial intelligence is unethical by itself unless it can be developed and programmed to follow society's ethics and morals if we are to fully utilize the benefits of AI. Although artificial intelligence can provide a helpful tool, the foundation of its research is from a collection of people's data. According to a specialist in cybersecurity and privacy law, Charlotte Schneider explains companies use algorithms of AI to collect people's data online in order to enhance efficiency or market offerings, but the data is sold to third parties. These third parties are selling and buying data and run the risk of exposing personal information of the data's owner. With this data, AI creates algorithms on human behavior and increases the cycle of selling and exposing data. Privacy breaches are the consequence of having AI being developed further and uncontrolled. An example for the controlling of AI by attorney Matthew Shear is developing an, a an Artificial Intelligence Development Act, which would enact an agency. This agency could be a board of governors who define and certify AI systems. However, in order for the act to take effect, these systems must be held accountable. The agency's court must regulate certified AI, neglecting the rules and uncertified AI systems to hold strict liability. The designers, manufacturers, and distributors must take liability as well. The authority of AI holds the responsibility to create and control beneficial and ethical uses of artificial intelligence in our society. Human skills and knowledge can only be synchronously accessed by one other person, which is the reason why we waste so much time today on actions like waiting to be seen by a doctor at a clinic. With online AI physicians or teachers, they can be accessed by any number of people at the same time at any time of day. They can also be replicated and duplicated to provide infinite versions of themselves, and each will have the most recent and complete database of research and information available. When it comes to medicine and AI, genetic information may soon be incorporated into computerized medical records, giving physicians additional data of greater clinical interest. Another challenge that we may one day have to face is chatbots created by AI or the feminine stereotype with high-pitched voices and names such as Alexa by Amazon. These bots are made to serve people with their daily tasks and having them be mostly voices of women points fingers to the female stereotype of women always being the ones to do household labor and serve people. If you look at the direction we are headed, these stereotypes are being looked down upon in society, and before you know it, it can cause an uproar by the people of today's generation. Well, that was a video. Um, I guess the lesson to be learned from that is invest in a Tesla so you won't run over children. The next video is from Audrey Burgeon and Grace Calarian about artificial intelligence and science fiction. You guys watch that. I'm going to close my closet. Consciousness and AI, why sci-fi got it wrong. Artificial intelligence is something that has been present in science fiction since at least the 19th century. Samuel Butler's Air One, written in 1872, was one of the first novels to discuss the possibility of machines with intelligence akin to humans. The title of the book itself is the word Nowhere Scrambled. Nowhere is a utopia in Air One. According to the article Nowhere, Air One, Nowhere, which was satirically entitled Air One by Samuel Butler, is still being created today. This passage proves that AI is still a relevant topic in science fiction. Air One's stance on AI was that it had the capability and even desire to replace humans. The machines, or AI, in the book underwent near-constant evolution 
and really the only thing they needed humans for was for maintenance and repairs. Science fiction books like Air One describe societies with AI as desolate, dangerous landscapes. However, the peaceful coexistence of AI and humans today proves their theories wrong. The nature of science fiction literature is that it combines truth and fiction, or conjectures of the future. But these conjectures don't always prove to be true. In the 19th century, when Air One was written, England had just been through the Industrial Revolution. Society was nowhere near inventing AI, and therein lies the fictional portion of the book. Another book that delves into the relationship between humans and AI is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, which was written in 1968, almost a century after Air One. The novel's main character, Detective Rick Deckard, hunts down runaway androids who come from other planets. The world within this novel is eerie, as there are electronic pets, and Deckard's wife is addicted to virtual reality. One of the fears within this novel, besides the usual vision of the rise of AI and extinction of humans, is that AI had become so ingrained in their culture that they could no longer distinguish what was real and what was not. AI in science fiction was made popular by this book, in particular once it was adapted into the popular film Blade Runner. The article, Fiction That Gets AI Right, lists some more science fiction books, such as The Machine Stops, a short story written by E.M. Forrester in 1909, and R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, a play written by Carol Capek in 1920. So, many science fiction books cast AI as a conniving villain, but in reality, it has many beneficial uses in society and has yet to create an uprising that these and other novels have predicted. There is much tension or controversy regarding the presence and characteristics of AI in science fiction. First off, there are those who believe that AI will eventually pose a threat to humanity and that this should be the stance that science fiction literature takes on the matter. These beliefs may stem from the loss of jobs that could come from the increased presence and evolution of AI in society, as well as the competition that AI could pose to humans. Some might say that the threat comes from the fact that they can be programmed, which may take less effort to, say, train a human. If employers were to continually choose AI, which requires little training, over humans, then humans could eventually become obsolete in the job field. This choice could lead to mass unemployment, which is at the root of this argument of the future of AI and how it should be portrayed in science fiction. On the other hand, there are those who believe that AI is more of a benefit than a detriment to society, and that this will continue to be the case, and thus science fiction should portray AI as a benefit. The author of 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Yuval Noah Harari, gives evidence that AI is beneficial by explaining AI might help, help create new human jobs. Thus, Harari is a proponent of the belief of AI being advantageous. These opposing opinions have already created tensions and controversies between the two, and will likely become heightened in the future, with the advancement of AI and technology in general. Like mentioned in Air One, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and countless other science fiction stories and movies, many assume that AI will replace humans and that it is something that needs to be feared. However, according to David Deming, the real danger does not lie in the technology. Instead, it's about politics and economic fairness. Deming explains how AI will merely shift around jobs rather than replace them completely, as new demands emerge with the rise of technology. For example, even though online shopping, in which AI is able to cater to our preferences, is increasing at a tremendous rate, online shopping has not changed our appetites for consumption, and that it might even have increased. He points out that the real concern with AI is whether the pain and the benefits of it are equitably distributed, and whether the turmoil that is still to come will be viewed as an overall social good. If we were to assume that robots with artificial intelligence will replace humans like science fiction does, then the robots will ultimately have jurisdiction over what happens to humans and what happens to AI. Since artificial intelligence will not take over anytime soon, the government will most likely be responsible for regulating AI. But there are some problems that arise if this were to happen. Because AI has a wide range of applications in many emerging technologies, no single entity would be fully capable of governing the various fields of AI. In addition, each of the fields that AI can be applied to, like biotechnology and automation, are evolving so rapidly that by the time government passes legislation, it may not be applicable anymore. For these reasons, many have proposed to pass soft laws or programs that create substantive expectations but which are not directly enforceable by the government.
to regulate AI. According to Gary Marchant, these soft laws would have a variety of forms and formats, such as a code of conduct, ethical statements, professional guidelines, or statements of principles. Because traditional forms of government regulation are too slow, ossified, and limited to provide comprehensive and meaningful oversight of emerging technologies, soft laws or other proposals that may be introduced in the future may be better alternatives. In the future, AI will likely look much different than it does today. Already we have come far from the Industrial Revolution, with its non-sentient, hulking machines to sleek, sentient machines. If this is any indication of what the future of AI will look like, then there are many advancements of AI to come. Soon, there will no longer be a generation of people who knew life before AI. This may be hard for those who are older and function for a long time without the technology of today to imagine and agree to, if they are given a choice in the matter. Yuval Noah Harari discusses the future and explains, instead of humans competing with AI, they could focus on servicing and leveraging AI. The job market of 2050 might well be characterized by human-AI cooperation rather than competition. This passage asserts that Harari sees AI as something that is mostly beneficial to society and will create jobs in the future. In closing, the future challenges of AI, including the fear of job loss, whether warranted or not, as well as the possibility of competition between humans and AI. All right, Grace. If AI isn't the, the conniving villain that you say it is, explain this episode of SpongeBob. Yeah, that's what I thought. The next video is actually two videos from Grace Bolton and Elizabeth Pogosian. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, I just saw a funny Twitch word, and so I said that. Okay, but guys, why did you upload two separate videos? I mean, do you hate each other? Because if that was like a thing, I'd understand. But as of now, I'm just confused. Just play the video. As artificial intelligence makes its way to become a more favorable option for companies to use over natural intelligence, many warrants or assumptions and values can be made about artificial intelligence. In the article, The Impact of Robots on Employment by Arnold Brown, Brown explains how companies are turning to AI due to the increasing ability to have work done not only off-site and by other entities such as unanticipated competitors by non-humans. Because companies and job providers are more commonly turning to artificial intelligence to simply simplify their work, this leaves more high-degree jobs available for people. Furthermore, this causes many people to be left with the only option of getting a higher level of education. However, not everyone is able to access this level of education, whether it be due to financial stability, not having the time, or even having the mental capacity to learn such a difficult topic. In Yuval Noah Harari's book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Harari explains that AI will be able to outperform humans even in tasks that supposedly demand intuition. Due to wanting more efficiency within the work environment, companies will be motivated to turn to AI and further make advancements, thus creating a preference for artificial intelligence over natural intelligence. In the article, The Real Threat of Artificial Intelligence by Kai-Fu Lee, Lee explains how unlike the Industrial Revolution and the Computer Revolution, the AI revolution is not taking certain jobs and replacing them with other jobs. Instead, it is poised to bring about a wide-scale decimation of jobs, mostly lower paying jobs, but some higher paying ones too. Moreover, the advancement and transition to a predominantly AI field job extinctions will increase. This will further challenge individuals to get a new job since most basic skill jobs, not including hands-on work, will be unavailable for people to take on. Through the progression of AI revolution, Challenges in the future will arise due to loss of jobs and transitioning from natural to artificial intelligence. In the impact of robots on employment, Brown explains how after people begin to lose their jobs to AI, not everyone will have transferable skills to get a new job. In consequence, this will force the government to grant aid to people who aren't able to accumulate the skills to get back into the workforce. Society must be able to aid and further incorporate individuals out of jobs. 
due to AI back into the workforce. In Harari's book, he also explains how as people are put out of jobs, they will begin to accumulate mental health issues, such as anxiety and depression due to the inability to get a new job, thus making it more difficult for people to gain the motivation to make themselves financially stable once again by getting a job. Due to shame of not being able to get a new job because of the lack of skills for the higher level jobs available, this will begin to deteriorate the mental health of the ones who have suffered a job loss. Loss of jobs. It wasn't immigration after all. While some are fearful of job loss due to immigration, with the advancement of technology and AI in our fourth industrial revolution, there is much more reason to be concerned with the idea of AI eventually having the potential to take away every job. Today, as technology surrounds our everyday lives, many are concerned with technology and AI replacing people in the workplace. Yuval Noah Harari, historian and philosopher, claims that the technological revolution might soon push billions of humans out of the job market and create a massive new useless class leading to social and political upheavals that no existing ideology knows how to handle. As there becomes a rise in the development of AI, jobs will have to change and move around to accommodate these advances. Some might be lost, and many have already been lost, which is why there is a lot of concern regarding this topic. However, others claim that technology won't necessarily take more jobs away, but change them. Robert Atkinson, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, states that IBM's Watson Cognitive Computing System could help doctors make faster and better medical diagnoses, and 20% of a typical CEO's time could be replaced by technology such as artificial intelligence. Therefore, there are mixed opinions regarding the development of AI, and while some think that all jobs will event eventually be replaced, others claim that they will only be changed. Even so, there are certainly going to be drastic changes that people will have to accommodate to within their occupational lives. The tension lies in the question of whether or not it is right to be taking away people's jobs and the uncertainty over the future of advanced technology, as well as figuring out how we will make accommodations to ensure that people do not end up losing their jobs. There are some organizations that are already helping to prevent jobs from being lost due to automation, such as Opportunity at Work, and Center on Rural Innovation. Kaya Perina, Editor-in-Chief of Psychology Today, claims that there's endless hand-wringing about just how soon AI and automation will gut today's workforce. These organizations flip the equation in the narrative with their focus on human labor that can enrich the tech sector. In this, they meet multiple demands at once. Science and the advancement of AI will continue to grow no matter what. However, it will be up to businesses that will either have to incorporate technology into professions or replace them altogether. This is because of how artificial intelligence and automation has a huge effect on these businesses that employ people. Earl Graves, American businessman of Black Enterprise, says the reality is that artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, robotics, data analytics, virtual reality, blockchain, and 5G will dramatically alter how you conduct business and more importantly, how consumers, including your customers, access products and services. So eventually, it will be up to businesses to decide how much they want to integrate AI into the workforce. That decision will ultimately have a huge impact on job status and security. I don't even know who most of these sources are. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't trust you or believe you. You know a source that I do trust? South Park. They took our jobs! So for this next video, I had a really, really funny joke that I was going to put in with some unused footage, but I texted Madison about it, and this, this was her response. So I'm not sure she wanted me to use it. Anyway, here's the video. Ready? Over the last decade, with the rise of online shopping, social media, and other technological advancements, there has been a rising concern about the amount of personal information citizens have on the internet. And when it comes to privacy, the U.S. is unique compared to other developed countries in that it has no overarching privacy laws in its constitution. In fact, the current interpretation of the U.S. Constitution makes it difficult to create a central privacy to write and enforce privacy legislation. Rather, there are state-specific privacy laws in place. 
Right. So the Constitution values the right to free speech over the right to privacy, which means legislation designed to protect privacy can often violate speech rights. For example, in June 2018, California passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, or the CCPA. And this act is modeled after the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. And it gives citizens in California more autonomy over their data. Right, but however, according to Sequoia's article, it's entitled Personal Data Vulnerability, Constitutional Issues with the California Consumer Privacy Act. This law has received pushback in the court because it quotes that the act violates First Amendment principles by restricting a business's ability to disseminate accurate and publicly available information. So the U.S. doesn't have really any overarching privacy legislation other than highly specific cases like HIPAA, COPPA, and the U.S. Privacy Act. And these acts protect the government from misusing citizens' data, and they protect children under a certain age. Um, it protects their personal data, but there's no overarching protection from businesses. Yeah, and in 2018, the conversation around data privacy had a great shift here in the United States, and that change was due to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. The article titled Pseudo Public Political Speech Democratic Implications of the Cambridge Analytica Scandal by Jonathan Hewood reported that the Cambridge Analytica is a branch of the Strategic Communication Laboratories Group that was founded in 1933. And in hopes they understood that the com consumer behavior was enough to influence the outcomes of elections and other political events, both in the US and in the UK. Right, so Cambridge Analytica itself was not founded until 2013 by the director at SCL, Alexander Nix. And it was funded by a whopping $15 million by Republican donor Robert Mercer. And then in addition to this, former President Trump's political advisor, Steve Bannon, also was on the board of directors at the new SCL offshoot. So there was a lot of intertwining in there. Yeah, totally. And in addition to that, they built the psychological profiles of over about 80 mil 87 million Facebook users by collecting personal information like posts, stories, and Facebook group users interacted with how they interacted and so on without the user's consent. Right, and that was over time, right? Since 2013 to 2018 when all that came out. Mm -hmm. And as discussed in Hewitt's article, this information was used to create targeted political ads to influence the outcomes of elections, including the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the election of Ted Cruz and the Brexit referendum. So with that being said, what's the big deal? Companies do market research like this all the time. So why is this different? So one reason why the experiments um, Cambridge Analytica was conducting is so unethical is because it tampered with democracy. We assume that elections are fair and we assume that it is morally and ethically wrong to manipulate and mislead voters in order to change the outcome of an election. Because as Americans, we value an equal electoral process. Right, we do. And so really the tension of this debate comes down to its impact on democracy. How these, inform how these advertisements that were developed from subjects who did not consent to have their information taken and analyzed the impact of the elections in the United States and in the UK. He would provide a great article of our great explanation for this. And that is kind of that Micro-targeting means, uh, means that this kind of micro-targeting means that claims and campaign promises made in the privateness of an individual user's fee can't be corrected in the marketplace of ideas. And because individual users are seeing curated advertisements that are statistically proven to tug on their emotional heartstrings based on their information collected from them or people even like them, there is no other body or system of checks to ensure this information is accurate and correct. Wait, did she, did she say it could be incorrect? We're okay then. And not only is this harmful because it may contain misinformation, but it is extremely unethical. So allowing political parties to make hollow and contradicting promises to different populations of voters is manipulative and it undermines the transparency required from political parties to, for democracy to function. So there's a little bit of irony in this situation, right? The United States has a lack of privacy legislation because they see freedom of speech as more important to maintain democracy. 
And that very priority allowed our democracy to be completely undermined. It was the US's lack of privacy laws, which they had done on purpose, right? Constructing the constitution in a way that freedom of speech is valued over privacy that allowed this breach to happen. Yeah, and to this day, Facebook still hasn't changed. It is still leaking inform- it's still leaking their information. And Michael Nunez explained in his article ta- that the Facebook is still leaking data more and more every year after the Cambridge Analytica. And it reached out to 100 developer partners who may have improperly accessed user data and at least 11 developer partners access the user data within the last 60 days. So who should be in charge at this point? Well, many argue that the US should adopt stronger privacy laws on social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram to protect citizens' data. The problem becomes, in order to do this, there must be amendments to the US Constitution, which many lawmakers are hesitant to do. And further, even if the US were to pass stricter privacy laws, it's still difficult to monitor and control. Facebook is a private company that has really monopolized the social media world as a whole. Right, so if we really want change, we can't rely on this multi-million, billion dollar corporation to regulate themselves. Their business model is dependent on exploiting consumer data and whether that information goes to corrupt political parties or money hungry businesses, Facebook doesn't care. So, you guys may or may not have seen me go into Rob, supposedly, what was a casino, right? That's not true, that was never gonna happen, Uh, they even said in the video it wasn't gonna happen. You know what I'm doing? I am... I'm going to protest big tech. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to Facebook headquarters right now. Watch, watch me. I... I'm going. Our next video is on a topic you probably heard a lot about in October and November. I'm talking about Section 230. We got a video here. I'm going to play that and then take the stuff off. So let's... uh... Hello, everyone. My name is Logan Burrell. My partner is Shadi Hamidin. And the topic we'll be discussing during this podcast is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. We'll be talking specifically about what Section 230 is, why it was created, as well as the different controversial aspects and implications of it in our country. Section 230 was enacted by the 104th United States Congress in the year 1996 as a part of the Communications Decency Act. This was the United States' first response to the ongoing evolution of a phenomenon called the internet. According to an article written by George Fishback titled How the Wolf of Wall Street Shaped the Internet, a review of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it states that Section 230 removed publisher liability from internet service websites for the content published by its users. This means that platforms would not be responsible for what the users post on them. Section 230 stopped the websites from having to monitor its content in order to allow those websites to grow without fear of liability for the content that is, that is posted on those websites. Now moving on to the tensions. The concern for le- legal content circulating through social media platforms alike has drawn attention to the extent Section 230 acts as a safeguard for these companies free from legal ramifications. One such event that has provoked this inquiry is whether or not Facebook or other and other social media platforms alike should be held as guilty by association when permitting mass violence. In 2017, the Myanmar military organized a series of attacks upon the Muslim community within the state. To communicate among members of the military to execute their genocidal order, orders, they exploited Facebook as a tool for ethnic cleansing. A potential warrant for this would be that there were no measures taken to inhibit their widespread message of inflicting substantial harm. The duty of these sites to block such violent threats is evident. Also, one could argue that the US has a duty under international law to prevent large scale atrocities like genocide. Backpage.com was launched with the intent of establishing the world's largest online provider of adult service ads. In reality, CEO Carl Ferrer and company repeatedly responded with no comment when interrogated by the press, judges, and legislators to charges of sex trafficking. In the article titled Freedom, Commerce, Bodies, Harm, the case of Backpage.com, author Elizabeth Swanson provides a series of cases against Backpage.com where young girls were being sold through trafficking advertisements on the website. In each case, these children were kidnapped and sent for forced sex work spanning several months. Because of the confined text within Section 230, the publisher was still protected after there was evidence supporting their act as a co-conspirator in a federal crime. 
illegal sexual purchases. Furthermore, as a warrant, a valid stance would be that allowing minors to be sex trafficked is morally repulsive and wrong. Due, the, due to the implications of Section 230, Backpage.com was barricaded from receiving any criminal consequences under current law while facilitating the advertisement, which highlights an arguable reason why changes should be made. A testimony made by Chief Executive of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, presented his thoughts on the matter. He admits that people want to know that companies are taking responsibility for combating harmful content, specifically addressing illegal matters on platforms. This is significant because in Chapter 5 of Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, he indicates the backlash that spurred from the Cambridge Analytical scandal, where, on Facebook, elections worldwide were manipulated by the creation of algorithms through the immense collection of user data. Zuckerberg was a scapegoat for this incident and knows firsthand the effects that it had on his company's reputation, yet still entertains the measure reform. There are those who have expressed concerns with breaching the limits of free speech. The First Amendment stands as a, as a testament to American liberty. They may contend that if legislators arbitrarily define the, the definition, citizens' freedom may not amount to their expectations. Furthermore, terms such as terrorism, which have been commonly understood in varying contexts, present difficulty in attaining having meeting between vague and specific when, amade, when amending Section 230 for enforcement purposes. Although this does seem like a sound debate at face value, it is worth noting that in the bulk of the 300 cases adjuncting to Section 230, the majority involve defamation and not allegations of criminal conduct. This statistic denotes that the majority of cases relative to Section 230 revolve around falsified content rather than illegal activity. Others may counter that the regulation objective is to degrade the importance of, a, of expression, but rather concentrate attention to saving lives as a, as a subsequent outcome. They may also contend that by governing the information which serves on ISPs or internet service providers and intercepting those with unlawful motives, online security will receive a massive boost contributing to a safer, uh, and to safer environments globally. So now I'm gonna get into the jurisdiction when it comes to section 230. So to so those who would be obliged to participate in amending Section 230 would be legislatures. Since this is a piece of legislation that falls under the Communications Decency Act, legislatures must make a conscious effort to monitor the effects of passing reform versions and adjusting anything if needed. This will require legislation to be passed, which means Congress must work together in order to form legislation that both sides agree on and then pass it. This could be a very difficult task because Republicans and Democrats both want to reform Section 230, but they want to reform it for different reasons. So actually coming up with a reform that satisfies the issues that both parties have with Section 230 would be the most difficult part of this process. So some of the future challenges, depending on someone's political beliefs, there are many different future challenges that will come forth due to Section 230 that have already been brought forward. Both Republicans and Democrats have expressed their concerns for the future of social media when it comes to the incorporation and usage of Section 230. According to an article written by Arthur Bright titled, Does the Future of Social Media Really Hinge on These 26 Words? He states that Democrats' concerns revolve around harassment and misinformation, while Republicans' concerns is focused on political speech. Both political parties have concerns with Section 230, and they want those concerns to be addressed as soon as possible. One way the people who side with Republicans' concerns are dealing with these issues they believe in are through creating their own social media apps. Recently, an app called Parler was created and it is marketed as a free speech social network. This was created to su supply people who are against the Twitter ban of Donald Trump, a place where they can speak freely. A concern with this is that it can foreshadow a future where new social media platforms are created based off of political views. This means that there will be an even further divide between people because they'll be using social media that aligns with their viewpoints. This does not allow people to debate and share ideas and instead will result in groups of people who already agree with each other, just sharing the same information. Apps with users sharing the same information. So it's like an echo chamber. <laughs> Wait, Logan, that already exists, it's Twitter. So by now, a lot of you are probably asking, Hey Ethan, why are you dressed like Saul Goodman on a good day or Arthur Curry on a bad one? And my answer is, because I'm, I'm trying to confuse the algorithm. I'm wearing all these different colors so it doesn't know what to assume about me. It can't, it can't pinpoint one, one specific thing about me. I'm confusing big tech, you understand? I don't know how algorithms work. There's a video that I'm going to play and we're going to learn about it together though. Okay, so my partner and I's topic is algorithms deliver fairness. 
So just some context, in their most basic form, AI algorithms are just advanced versions of the standard algorithm. According to the Merriam-Webster, an algorithm is a procedure for solving a mathematical problem in an infinite number of steps that frequently involves repetition of an operation. And um, algorithm expanded their definition to commonly include AI algorithms as large as companies such as Google and YouTube. They begin to utilize um, these algorithms. And here's just a simple explanation of what an algorithm is. You just simply just put an input through a set of rules and you get um, an expected output. More context, uh, AI algorithms are set apart are, are set apart from the basic counterpart through their learning skills. An AI algorithm learn as it ages and um, it will continue to do so as long as technology advances. So as long as technology continues to advance, you know, year in and year out, so will AI algorithms. And in the article, few people understand how algorithms shape their lives. It explains um, how, big how big companies utilize AI algorithms. Uh, she says that it allows large companies to make personalized suggestions for their users, which they say otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. They also allow companies to utilize a marketing strategy known as micro-targeting. Today, the use of AI algorithms can be observed in many online platforms. However, the presence has caused some tensions to rise. Uh, one of these tensions being that AI algorithms do not reason like humans do, and um, therefore they can still develop biases from the data they are fed. In this way, the only reason humans should fear bias from an algorithm would be because the human designing the algorithm placed an unfair emphasis on a given result. Um, the article, Persons Without Qualities, Algorithms, AI, and the Reshaping of Ourselves, um, explains this a little further. And it says that AI algorithms are more fair than humans in making decisions. Um, humans reason, human reasoning usually considers unnecessary factors when making decisions. And um, well, AIs don't because they don't have the same reasoning. Um, you know, humans rely on emotions, intuition, personal experience, you know, insight when decision making. But AI factors all that out, showing that they could do the, the most fair decision. And um, even though algorithms can be designed with biases, they're a result of the designer and can be avoided. Humans, in contrast, have biases that are subconscious and unavoidable. So some warrants for, um, for AI algorithms are or can be found in courts. Like I mentioned, they have the ability to factor out unnecessary you know, emotions when, when conducting a decision, and this can lead to a more fair trial and reduce the possibility of serving unwanted time. And here I have a quote from the article, Artificial Intelligence Benefits and Unknown Risk. It said, it, to sum it up, it pretty much says that with the use of algorithms, it can increase fairness and accuracy in decisions that the court makes. And when it comes down to it, or when it comes to a trial, everyone wants to have a fair case and no one wants to serve an unnecessary amount of time, which is why people support the want for, um, AI in courts. Another place where algorithms can be warranted is in, when employing people. There are instances where the employer can have a slight bias and may not hire a better candidate simply because they are discriminated towards them. In the article, um, in the article Big Data and Artificial Intelligence, there's uh, I use the quote that says, a lot of employers use artificial intelligence to solve problems facing human resources departments because they know, or uh, because it knows it knows better than what, what they do. So it's also, this is also um, important because when applying for a job, you wanna be, or you wanna have the same opportunity as someone else. And you know, you don't wanna be discriminated on. So by having AI algorithms choosing an, um, an employee, it can factor out, you know, um, it can factor out gender, race, skin color, you know, whatever, and just focus on the worker themselves. Some challenges that come with AI are um, in the workspace, it can be seen as unfair for various reasons. In um, the article, Designing Fair AI for Managing Employees and Organizations, unfairness has been related with a decreased work worker effort and increased worker turnover. And since AIs are taught to think, are being taught to think independent of a human, their decisions don't necessarily apply to a single individual. Instead, their fairness is taught to generalize. So 
when it comes to, you know, a certain individual that AI is not going to know what to do because their fairness is based off generalization. Another um, challenge is in the courts itself. Um, in the article, Racial Equity and Algorithmic Criminal Justice, it points out, it, it points out this challenge. And it pretty much says that since AIs lack common sense that's needed to, um, to sentence a human, it, it, it shouldn't be used because, you know, it, it can't solve complex issues such as, you know, racial equity, you know, racial dimensions, and it doesn't fully understand those concepts. So it still needs human supervisions and it still needs that common sense. So some jurisdiction, um, although AI algorithms span across country lines, it is first the duty of the researchers and developers to make sure their algorithms are fair. In the article, AI and the illusion of human algorithm complementary, the authors mentioned that neural information processing systems conference, or, or yeah, <laughs> they, the, they mentioned the neural information processing system conference. This is an annual conference which brings together AI researchers and at this conference, they're responsible for providing new information to each other and monitoring the progression of technology of the uh, AI technology. Um, but it's not just to the or it's just not the researchers' job to upkeep with AI algorithms. It's also the states; they could make laws to help prevent AI becoming too powerful and crossing the line. Um, you know, areas that areas of concern that should be addressed, you know, are ethics, justice, equity, privacy, data availability, and national policy. So, with these safeguards, it can or with those, with those checks, it could safeguard against the tensions of algorithms gaining too much power. So I was completely wrong. Um, it's not because of the colors that I'm wearing. I mean, unless they can see through my webcam. Wait, there's there's always a red light. Why is there a blue? What's what's going on? The next video is gonna tell us whether or not algorithms are fair. It's, uh, oh wow, it's a long one. It's coming in at nine minutes, so you guys better, uh, buckle your seatbelts, because we're in for a ride. I'm Colton. And my name is Yanni Trevino. And, uh, we are going over, uh, the use of algorithms in certain, uh, areas, uh, and we're seeing if they're fair in the places that they're being utilized in. And so algorithms are uh, a set of instructions that uh, come with that produce an outcome using like mathematical equations. And these uh, and the results can be nearly instant or it can take a long time, depending on how much data is put into them. And then uh, every time uh, they will produce a the same outcome if they're put in the same data. So there is no randomness as to uh, a human making the same uh, uh, judgment on the specific set of data. And so uh, algorithms are mainly used to uh, recommend uh, certain uh, decisions. So they, they don't, they usually don't create the final uh, verdict on a certain subject, but they usually uh, influence on uh, what is finally decided and with the and with coronavirus and with uh, social distancing a lot of uh, uh, algorithms had to be developed in order to make decisions when humans were absent since you cannot have very many people around so that furthered the use of algorithms in society And then um, we're also going to be discussing the attention behind algorithms and how they differ between different um, parts of our systems in the U.S. So in the housing market system, in the past, we had problems of redlining and we still see those disparity, disparities today. So redlining is the illegal practice of refusing to provide financial services to customers based on the area that they live in. And the Fair Housing Act actually combated um, redlining to protect people of no matter their race, their gender, their religion, um, et cetera. And 
uh, gave them the tools and the resources to help them purchase the homes or rent the homes that they wanted to. Um, another problem that we see is in the justice system. Uh, we've, we're all pretty aware of the past struggles that we've had um, when it comes to the percentage of POC that we have um, in the incarcerated versus people who aren't people of color. Um, and so, and algorithms, algorithms are now being used to jail people to determine sentences and also to create um, bails for people. Um, social justice organizations like the ACLU and NAACP and Move On uh, generally op oppose algorithms, arguing that they reflect systemic biases against people of color. And then in general, there has also been tension in the past like, against the or of the ambiguity of loan officers. Um, one example where this can be seen is black farmers in America. Um, more often than not, it could be seen that black farmers don't get the loans that they need in an appropriate manner of time before harvest season and they therefore don't um, generate as much output as their counterparts who are white. And then uh, algorithms, when they are designed off of current uh, systems and use uh, data that and use biased data, they could also create the same bias that is currently seen in human decisions. And so just because it's an algorithm doesn't mean that it removes uh, bias entirely. It has to be designed in a way to uh, reduce the amount of bias that a human would make using the same decision. And so, um, society um, don't quite completely understand uh, technology and the algorithms it uses and uh, and they don't they don't understand it as well as like a human being and so they don't they don't quite trust the uh, the decisions that the that technology can make using algorithms and uh, this can be seen with like generational gaps where uh, where uh, younger generations are able to uh, grow up and like understand uh, the the technology since they use a lot more of their time uh, getting to understand it, and while as like uh, older generations uh, have not had as much time to get used to it and don't quite understand something that they don't they don't know. They don't, they don't trust something they don't understand. And then uh, this can be applied to uh, socioeconomic sta statuses, socioeconomic statuses, where uh, it can, where people who are not able to, uh, to purchase the newer uh, technology coming out won't be as uh, in tune to the, to the developments that are currently in place and just and don't quite understand it as well as those who are able to afford the newer kinds. And then since algorithms are uh, computers and since they're supposed to be unbiased, uh, they can make uh, choices that uh, others would not see as like moral or right simply because uh, a computer does not have the same bias as a human does if it's designed in the right uh, way. So next is the question of jurisdiction. Um, ultimately, the government is responsible for implementing the use of algorithms into society. Um, the biggest question is, what's the breaking point and where do we draw the line? So. Governments need to create laws that explain in, de in detail the extent to which algorithms should be used. Um, currently in New Jersey, uh, they've created the Criminal Justice Act reform, which is just basically a risk assessment algorithm that determines whether 
uh, a defendant goes to jail before their date trial. And basically what it takes into account is um, past offenses, um, if the defendant has showed up to court day on time before, and then also the type of crimes that they committed. And then um, current, the current problem is that we lack experience in using uh, artificial intelligence in this way, so we really can't create principles or we don't really have a foundation to go off of. We're kind of just writing this all as we go. Um, and then the question is, um, should algorithms be used in every system? So would you personally want um, an algorithm to decide who you voted for? Is that too much? Or would you prefer just to have an algorithm decide what music you listen to? And then uh, as algorithms can be applied to more uh, subjects and do more choices and create better outcomes, uh, it could eventually remove a uh, human choice altogether. And uh, that could be either voluntary or involuntary, depending on how significant the choice is. And so eventually it, humans possibly might not be able to create their own uh, choices that really matter within their life. And they're all uh, dictated by an algorithm. The next video is from Tegan Arnold and Katie Bergman. Tegan has a YouTube channel of her own, and her sister got her wisdom teeth removed two years ago. Congratulations, Tegan's sister. Anyways, let's watch the video. Over the last decade, social media has transformed organizations and the way they conduct businesses online. As a result, social media marketing has become a big part of the business world. Facebook was one of the first social media platforms to gain popularity. It was the most visited online social network and was founded in 2004 with over 600 million users and in the presence of over 70 countries. The benefits of Facebook marketing range from lower communication costs, personalized and directed advertising, immediate feedback from the customers, word of mouth referrals, and positive influence on buyer behavior. Facebook advertisements reach many people and they reach them faster than faster than you can say the name of today's sponsor, G Fuel. Need some energy to record your podcast? G Fuel's gotcha. Don't you dare believe that there's lead in their drinks, regardless of what you've heard. G Fuel is committed to a lead-free environment and hasn't had a lead-related death since 2020. Mmm. Doesn't... Doesn't taste like lead. Go to gfuel.com and enter code English3H Artificial Intelligence Podcast for 10% off your order. Thanks again to G Fuel for sponsoring this video. Alternative styles of advertising. There are programs in artificial technology that can be used to increase the revenue and add interaction even more. Some of these programs include proprietary business efficiency tools and data analytics programs that use predictive modeling to improve performance. This allows for marketing companies to exponentially increase the amount of sales they make compared to before they started to incorporate Facebook into their marketing strategy. While Facebook is a great place for sellers, it's not always a great place for buyers because Facebook is also intensely ridiculed for their lack of protection for user information. Repeatedly, Zuckerberg has spoken to the American public, assuring them of the security and safety of the app. In a congressional hearing, Zuckerberg states, yes, we store data, some of that content with people's permission. When further inquired about what is done with the data, he addressed what he claimed was the very common misconception that Facebook sells data to advertisers. He revealed that instead of Facebook allowing advertisers to buy information of its users, they let Facebook know who they want to reach and then Facebook does the placement. This topic, which already caused a lot of suspicion from a good portion of the American public, was drastically exacerbated by the 2015 Cambridge Analytica scandal. This instance tested the validity of Facebook's claims of online security and ultimately led to the destruction of the company that was 
Cambridge Analytica. Users deciding their own privacy settings is one matter. However, Cambridge also made the decision for their friends and family members what their privacy settings would be. According to Brian Taran in What Can We Learn from the Facebook Cambridge Analytica Scandal, Kogan, who is the creator of Cambridge Analytica, confirmed that his app collected data from friends of users if privacy settings allowed them to access that information, including name, birthday, location, and other stuff. Tech giants often blame the masses for not reading the fine print, but this time they, they didn't disclose what information they would be taking from their associates. This inspired a sense of mis mistrust in millions of users and led to one question remaining in the mind of the Facebook community. How far will Facebook go to increase their profit? Regarding jurisdiction, anyone can put an ad on Facebook, but the ads have to be evaluated before it shows up on social media. Facebook has a team that reviews ads and involves a 24-hour turnaround rate. <laughs> the Facebook updated ad policy states that during the ad process, they'll check your images and the text to see if the ad is appropriate for social media or not. If the ad is not approved, then that means it's violating some type of ad policy. Things that are restricted range from illegal substances to discriminatory practices, but the ad can be modified and sent again for approval. Once it's approved, it'll start being run on Facebook. And if somehow inappropriate ads do make it through, then Facebook begins to rely on its users to report the problem. And then the ad will be taken down until it goes through the approval process again. This situation encompasses every Facebook user from the small business owner to a massive marketing team. The jurisdiction topic previously discussed leads us to into an assumption people often make when creating their advertisement. The assumption is that people can put whatever advertisements they want on Facebook because after all, they did pay for it. However, in the previous section, it was noted that there are many restrictions and guidelines that the advertisements must meet before their ad is approved by Facebook. Um, another assumption is from people who invest in Facebook advertising is that their ads will be interacted with by many people and businesses will flourish. They believe their company will receive an increase in customers and sales from the ads they put out on Facebook. However, this is not always the case, as revealed in the implications of Facebook marketing for organizations. Um, states, research showed that 39% of users never checked any ads. If the advertisements are not marketed toward the correct demographic, then it is a high likelihood that their business will not receive the spike in sales they had hoped for. While Facebook advertisements have the potential to increase the company's revenue, there is a chance it will not happen like they hoped. And there's also another assumption that goes along with this, that uh, users often believe they are invincible online and that their online profile is like impenetrable. And that's not true as discussed from the scandal earlier. There are various challenges that go along with this issue. And one hurdle that must be overcome or at least considered when using Facebook is online security. Um, should users be more aware of how their information is being given? And um, even though the Cambridge Analytica sent, uh, scandal was disheartening to many Americans, it also provided a sense of hope that this stuff was being unearthed and discovered and um, it held Facebook accountable at least. There are advertisements on Facebook that are genuinely harmful. Um, an example would be um, alcohol marketing and Patricia Nealon reveals how alcohol companies manipulate those in their late teens and early 20s in alcohol marketing on social media. Um, they basically prey on the need to resemble others in early adulthood um, and Overall, um, alcohol companies have strategically used Facebook to embed their al alcohol marketing into young adult social networking friendship activities, blurring the lines between user and alcohol brand generated content. Um, so this is kind of showing that it's almost directly related to increased alcohol addictions in um, those who are like in their mid twenties or, or uh, early twenties. And this can lead to an increase in depression and suicide. So there are various um, challenges that come along with technological advancement, even though there are uh, many rewards. Wow, that was a great video, Tegan. But I think my personal favorite on your channel has got to be digestive organ system presentation. I don't know. The next and last video videos is a two-parter. 
by Samuel and Delaney. Um, again, if there's something going on there, guys, just let me know. Uh, I knew a certified peer connector in high school, and I'd be more than willing to give them a call if you guys need anything. But until you can get those issues sorted out, we got the last two videos, and I'm going to play them. I'm Samuel Keller, and I will be discussing the different ways social media and big data corporations manipulate the decisions people make to achieve their own existential aims. <clears throat> to start off with, I will discuss the context part of this assignment. <clears throat> data mining information produced by people is one of the fundamental ways that companies such as Google and Facebook utilize the actions their users make to improve their services. <clears throat> Google, for example, uses a variety of different services and tools to harvest the data of its users. One of these tools, such as Google Now, monitors the rhythm, routines, and interests of a person's life to determine what information will be needed by the person next. <clears throat> According to Tama Lever, professor of Internet Studies for Curtin University in Western Australia, depending on the quantity of information that users decide to share with Google Now, this determines how accurate the customized results Google Now provides for its users will be. Through information that users share with Google Now, Google is able to collect personal data of its users without their awareness. This information gathered could then be used by Google to improve its services and make itself appeal more to its customers. Facebook, on the other hand, has used several different types of services to gather valuable information on its users. According to Lever, in 2007, Facebook developed a new service known as the Beacon Service, which showed the details of a user's retail history in their newsfeed. Through this service, Facebook could effectively determine what their users were interested in buying. And with this retail information, Facebook could develop advertisements that catch the interest of its consumers. However, due to the increasing suspicion by users that their private information was being violated, Facebook was forced to shut down this beacon service. These two examples of different services that Google and Facebook utilize to acquire their personal data of their users shows the different ways social media and big data corporations have been trying to discover new ways to generate more profits and manipulate their customers' decisions. Moving on to tensions, in some ways social media companies and big data have had a positive impact on people's lives, making it easier for them to communicate with one another. In the medical field, social media has helped increase the speed at which information can be communicated to patients and has provided physicians with a way to express support for their patients. According to Stephania J. Kirk, PhD student in the Community Health Sciences and Critical Care Medical Departments at University of Calgary, New social media resources such as communication platforms, educational material, and self-management guides have helped assist caregivers with making more thoughtful decisions on the care of their loved ones. Despite this, social media and big data corporations have also violated people's privacy by gathering their social media content through different, out through different outlets. According to Margaret Hu, Professor of Law and International Affairs at Penn State University, a newer social media surveillance software system called Geophedia is an example of a software that poses a risk to the safety of social media users' data. Due to the fact that Who claims Geophedia has the ability to group social media posts and geographical data of social media users, social media and big data corporations could easily access and exploit their users' private data. Aside from being a convenient harvesting tool for big data and social media corporations, Geofedia has violated the privacy of social media users in its own way. Based on who, even though the company Geofedia has claimed it is solely involved with helping group public information, media reports based on police records mention that Geofedia attempted to access private social media posts instead of information that was publicly posted. Geofedia's violation of its users' privacies is another example of how big data corporations manipulate private data, helping them achieve their own personal gains. Moving to jurisdiction, popular social media companies such as Google hold the power to address the issues of decision manipulation and data harvesting. According to Yuval Noah Harari, 
Once big data and social media companies gather enough data on life, they could not only control the decisions, decisions people make, but they could also use the information on organic life to develop inorganic life forms. The, these ideas that suggest that big data and social media companies can significantly influence the decisions people make through data harvesting. Another idea Harari reveals is that big data and social media companies are more interested in achieving their goals rather than addressing the increasing issues algorithms such as Google are having on human decision making. In his book 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Harari presents this growing problem of AI dominance when he mentions that Google wants to get to the point where someone could ask Google anything and get the best possible answer in the world. This statement Harari makes in his book demonstrates that big data and social media companies care more about the progression and success of their selves rather than the human freedom of free thought. Harari's evidence shows a different aspect of big data companies, their desire to develop inorganic life forms and increase Google algorithms demonstrates how big data companies extort and utilize personal information for their own benefit. Hello everyone, my name is Delaney Davis, and it is time to move on to the second part of our jurisdiction in this podcast. A few people in charge who have the ability to make major changes regarding the limitation of free will big data imposes on people are government officials. Government plays a huge role in monitoring big data companies and restricting their content. For example, they may place restrictions on certain social media sites in an attempt to prevent them from growing out of control and gaining too much power. In this new age of media, it seems as though governments are forced to have more transparency with the people. People now have the power of using social media sites to record and broadcast events that would have gone unnoticed pre-technology. This new power results in a decrease in governmental power, forcing governments to implement more restrictions on social media sites. There is also an aspect of greed and self-preservation involved. Certain politicians running for government may want control over content regarding their campaign. Governments also see human lives as disposable and lack empathy when evaluating their effect on people's privacies. AP technology writer Michael Ledecky in the article Is Big Data Turning Government into Big Brother? evaluates the government's influence on social media sites. It reads, Privacy advocates have long been concerned about the U.S. National Security Agency collecting data on U.S. citizens and foreigners. Recent reports that Verizon and likely other U.S. telecommunication firms are handing over phone logs are stirring new concern about surveillance activities. This direct quote includes not only how the U.S. but foreign countries are affected negatively by the government's control over how big data companies manipulate their consumers' decisions. As you can tell, governments aggressively collect data through big data collection, not taking into account the value of a person's privacy. Now that we have talked in detail of the jurisdiction, I will be discussing the negative challenges and effects big data corporations, specifically social media sites, have on free will. The first challenge regards the intense scope of which social media controls us through. It seems as though there is a general consensus that Americans are willing to make a trade-off between giving companies access to their personal data and in exchange receiving rewards, discounts, and other benefits considered valuable. Non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University, author Paul R. Pillar, commented on this by saying that people are voluntarily using a free service in return for being exposed to advertising, allowing the operator of the search engine or internet service provider to collect and exploit data about their interests. This relates to the claim because it shows an example of how exactly people are being manipulated for the profit of big data corporations, and that is through the collection and exploitation of their personal information. Author of the book 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Uvo Harari comments on this by predicting that there may come a time when it will become impossible to calculate and tax incomes in dollars because most transactions will involve only the exchange of information without any currency present. This could lead to an even further lack of security for not just social media users, but all victims of big data. This future prediction of an information currency is yet again another way big data corporations manipulate people's decisions and gain more control. The Gale, opposing, the Gale Opposing Viewpoints online collection provides an example of this lack of privacy. In the May of 2017, there was a data breach at the credit reporting agency Equifax that exposed over 145 million people's highly confidential personal and financial information. People whose data was compromised became vulnerable to identity theft, credit fraud, and other crimes. This data breach exemplifies the insane amount of power big data companies hold over their consumers' personal data, manipulating decisions to achieve their own existential aims. 
scale opposing, opposing viewpoints online collection provides another challenge that arises from big data infringing on our free will, data discrimination. Since so much of our lives exists online, what happens to the people who cannot afford a phone or a laptop? Data discrimination poses a particular risk for low-income and undeserving populations who tend to have limited resources and less access to information. This is an excellent example of how social media corporations manipulate our decisions because it shows how owning and having knowledge of technology is crucial to many aspects of life, including essential things like jobs and schooling. Another challenge. It may seem as though social media sites are all independent from each other, however this is not factual. All social media sites include an algorithm that connects them together. It is supposed to help aid consumers in making decisions, however in rea reality all it does is help increase profit and consumerism. For example, phone and streaming companies such as Verizon and Disney Plus will collaborate together by enticing possible customers into buying a phone with the promise of a free streaming service included. This connection to various big data companies just creates an even larger threat to consumers, almost making it impossible to separate information from site to site. Thank you so much for watching. Was that it? Was that all the videos? So I mean, I guess that's the end. So if you stuck around this long, good for you, unless Miss Elliot makes everyone watch it, which sucks for you, because I already watched it all. So I don't have to do it. Anyway, guys, I gotta get going. I have a special guest appearance on the Murray Show. Catch you later. Smile, though your heart is aching. Smile, even though it's breaking. When there are clouds. In the sky, you'll get by if you smile.